Now that we have a good relationship between the standard, reduct standard cell potential and the Gibbs energy, we can use this now to construct uh, any number of reactions that involve an oxidation reduction step and use those uh, half cell potentials that we talked about last time that are tabulated now in regular tables uh, to begin to construct those reactions and get a handle on what, uh, first of all, the global cell uh, potential might be and then uh, from that, from that the Gibbs energy. So what I want to do is talk about how we would combine those half cell reactions together in ways that would construct a real reaction. And uh, you'll not be surprised that some of the rules for doing this are very similar to the rules that we use for Hess's law. So rules for combining half cells. Okay, first of all, we've already seen one of the most important of those, and that is that if we reverse the direction, that is to say we take a reduction that's tabulated and convert it into an oxidation, which is simply the reverse reaction, we would simply uh, take, and I'll use some symbols to do this, we would simply take the negative of the standard reduction potential for that half cell, and that's something we could use. Now, once we have done that, we're going to have some of the half cells that would be written in a, a reduction uh, type of direction and others that would be written in an oxidation direction. So the oxidation has already incorporated that minus sign, so now we can simply add those up. So if, in other words, if we have a series of uh, half reactions, so I'll just say had half cell reactions together, then we would just uh, sum together the values of their half cell uh, standard potentials. So we would just add these together. That's very similar to Hess's law. So far nothing we've said here is really any different from the way we treated enthalpy in Hess's law. But the one rule that I have remaining is going to vary from that, and that is if we multiply a half cell reaction, what do we do then? Now why would we do this? Remember the half cell reactions have electrons as part of the reaction species. Ultimately, when we get to the end, we don't want to see those electrons. We're not really in the business of producing electrons or eating up electrons as part of a reaction. Those electrons uh, stay within the reaction species somehow. They just get transferred from one to the other. So we're going to have to multiply by numbers in order to get the number of electrons on either side of the chemical equation to balance. So that's why we would be multiplying half cell reactions. But what effect does that have on the... Um, reduction, the standard reduction potential that's tabulated? Well, this answer may surprise you, but it stays the same. It does not get multiplied by whatever you've had to multiply those half reactions by. So you might ask, well, why is that? Well, these values that we're tabulating, these are basically intensive properties. Okay, intensive in the way that temperature is like an intensive property, or molar volume is an intensive property. All right, so it's not going to change um, when we multiply it by some amount. The thing that regulates how it uh, goes by an amount is recall that we wrote down, you know, something like this. This is related to the Nernst. It is the Nernst equation. Okay, this number here. I've written it as n here, but I've written it as z before. That number is where we build in that multiplication factor. So what really counts in these cell potentials is the number of electrons that are being moved across the wire, and that will be the number that balances the number of electrons on either side of the equation when we add up our half cells. So multiplying these uh, standard reduction potentials doesn't matter, but it's that number at the end of the day that will matter in terms of scaling these properties. It's probably best for me to show you how this works with a real, uh, uh, with a real example. Uh, let's suppose that we're going to take a piece of sodium metal, um, which uh, you got to be careful with that. It's pretty volatile. And we're going to react it with bromine gas. Okay, So what will come out of this is we will produce two sodium ions and we will produce two bromide ions, Okay, which means we're probably going to need to uh, put a two in front of that sodium as well. Now, this would be made up of two uh, half-cell reactions, one of which would involve sodium going to sodium plus, plus one electron. 
All right, and this is the reverse of the um, of the reduction uh, of the reduction reaction that would look like this. This reduction reaction has a standard cell potential of let me make sure I got this right, plus 2.714. Okay, the bromine, on the other hand, is going to have a reduction, um, a reduction equation that looks like this, where we're adding two electrons to the bromine gas or liquid to form two bromide ions, and that has a standard reduction potential of plus 1.0652. Okay, so these are the two half reactions that are relevant to this full reaction that we might be interested in. So clearly we need to reverse this reaction to get the oxidation version, which means we are going to reverse the, um, I, and I got this reduction pitch wrong, it is negative, um, which means we're going to reverse the direction of this value so it's plus 2.714 for the oxidation version. So when I add those two half reactions up, when I add the uh, when I add the oxidation version of sodium, and I add the reduction version of bromine, I'll have plus 2.714 and plus 1.0652. So when I So when I add these two up, I'll end up with 3.779 volts as the cumulative cell potential for putting these two half cells together. All right, so this would represent the standard cell potential for the reaction that I'm interested in. And I could then use this directly to determine, for example, what delta G might be in this case. Delta G for the reaction is going to be minus Z F times the cell potential. In this case, Z is going to be two electrons because I have to multiply this by two, but I don't change this value when I multiply by two. So when I do that, I'll end up with two here for Z and my normal value for the Faraday constant and 3.779 here for the cell potential. And the ultimate result is that I'll find that G is equal to minus 729 kilojoules per mole. All right, so the delta G for this reaction is very large and very negative. So one of the things we can conclude is that this is a very spontaneous reaction. And as it turns out, a very complete reaction. All right, so this is something that, uh, that would probably happen very quickly and right in front of your eyes. All right, so um, this is one of the things that we can do in terms of constructing uh, equations. But another thing that we might be interested in is using the information from our electrochemical cell uh, to determine an equilibrium constant. So how do we do that? Well, remember that for equilibrium, I had this condition, which meant that since this is equal to the standard reference value of the Gibbs energy plus RT log of the thermodynamic reaction quotient, that I could write this, if it's equal to zero, then this reaction quotient is going to become the equilibrium constant. So that means I can write the equilibrium constant is written in terms of this Gibbs energy like this. Okay, but I can write this Gibbs energy in terms of the standard cell, standard cell potential here. So that standard cell potential is just going to be um, minus Z F times the standard cell potential, and now divided by R T. Now notice I have two negatives here, so I can turn those into positives. All right. Now when I see that. What this does is it gives me a prescription for going from the equilibrium constant to a standard cell potential. And so this, in fact, is a fundamental relationship that we uh, probably want to put a box around and remember because this will be a very useful relationship if we want to determine the equilibrium constant for reactions 
uh, that can be set up in terms of an electrochemical cell. I also want to point out something, and that is that this thermodynamic equilibrium constant is written in terms of the uh, activities of all of these quantities, with the re products divided by the reactants. And I'm smushing this in here so it's a little crowded. Okay, but it's in terms of these activities, and each of these activities, I'll say A sub alpha, is written in terms of an activity coefficient times some standard reference. That standard reference could be um, some you know, bar of pressure, or it could be one molal of concentration, uh, but it is some sort of standard, and I'll, I'll write that standard as A sub zero, A zero. Okay, these activity coefficients, uh, you may have wondered where do they come from? How do we learn about them? Well, in fact, because of this relationship between the equilibrium constant and the standard cell potential, we can actually use electrochemical means to determine these standard cell potentials. What we would have to do, though, is measure those standard cell potentials under several different uh, conditions and extrapolate to the condition that represents these reference values for the activities that is to say one bar of pressure or one molal of concentration. Or in the case of the Henry's Law standard, it might be zero molal standard. So what we typically do is run a bunch of experiments with uh, different concentrations of our key, ind key indicators and find via extrapolation what the value of this activity coefficient would be. I'm not going to ask you any problems about that, but it's something I think you need to be aware of and one of the reasons that I wanted to go into this electrochemistry uh, lesson so that you could see that there really are some good experimental ways for us to get a handle on these quantities.